from deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together they're raising an ever-growing army of adorkable children and planning the revolution. <laughs> All right. We have a, a, a guest who was kind enough to join us at, on very short notice. Yes. And we've been talking about having him on for a long time, but he, uh, we're time like, okay, right. we, we got to find someone who. Somebody. Can, Some special, special moment. Yeah. Some who strange can, frame uh, of mind. Yet, yeah. who, can, who can join us? So this is Elias Krim. And you're hey, uh, Skyping in from uh, Valparaiso? Happily Skyping in from leafy Valparaiso, Indiana. Marvelous. Uh, great, great to reconnect with you guys. Haven't talked to you in a while. Yeah. No, it's, I, I think, too long, actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Elias just commented when mm-hmm. I uh, sent him a note on, uh, on uh, Facebook Messenger that it looks like the last time we spoke was 2014. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little while. Keep it. Keep it. At, least, at least right. on Facebook Messenger. Right. Uh, yeah. right. Yeah. And I think the last time I saw Elias was last fall. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been a little while. I I think it was the uh, front porch, the FPR conference. Yeah. 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 When you guys crashed here and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. Yeah. This was um, last September. Or was it a year ago? It was a year ago. It was like a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. And that was in, I think, um, Holland, Holland, Michigan. Yes. Okay. I'm there. That's right. That's right. Is that, am I doing that with the cord? Yes. Sorry, I'll stop. Don't do that with the cord. <laughs> no fidgeting. I'm fidgeting with the cord. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. That was me. Can, can you come up with a, a good introduction for for uh, so I guess yes, I think I can. <laughs> Elias is the founder and principal at Solidarity Hall. Yes, and um, it is a publishing house, blog, podcast, writing platform, exploring the common good and Colonial mystery. Yes, it, yes the, it's a perennial mystery of what the common good even is <laughs> and how to support it. So, and, and really how we need to turn our attention in these times to, to support the common good. Is that, yeah. is that fair? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's an apt description. Okay. But I'm hoping Elias can flesh that out for us more. Yes. Yes, that's actually All kind right. of the sort of the idea. Oh. But yeah, if if this was a talk, some someone would have to read like a a brief introduction. Yes, so there's <laughs> that. Everyone would be t- tapping their fingers, waiting for it right. to be so, over. So right. yeah, mm-hmm. well, so this is this is the part where I'm supposed to say, yes, but do we do anything? You know. <laughs> oh well, well, there's that. <laughs> but you do. I know you're busy in Valparaiso. I, yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Grace, thanks. <clears throat> they, many, many, not really related to Solidarity Hall, other than sort of fodder. You know, for the blog, I guess, mm-hmm. um, which is okay. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, in a general way, what we've been doing the last year or two is just trying to figure out how Solidarity Hall can touch the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, what would that mean? And so uh, we've made a few experiments. Um, the notable one, I would say, was our attempt to do some community microfunding dinners in the region. Oh. Um, I have been watching uh, Detroit for a while, and the project there called Detroit Soup. Yes. And so we knocked off Detroit Soup. And Shore Soup. The what soup? South Shore Soup. Because we're oh, South, South Shore. Michigan. So we did one in Michigan City, and we did one in Gary. And uh, this has been now over a year, year and a half ago. Um, so we had nice chaps for both. We had people from the immediate vicinity, from the neighborhood, come in and we're, for three or four minutes, pitch an idea. And uh, then the winner. We're getting a, uh, Elias. Elias. Uh, I'm, we're getting a really bad audio. It's just breaking down into like uh, robot <laughs> robot tones. And, yeah. I'm gonna let me see if our uh, housemate is is streaming uh, TV. Oh, and slowing down our connection. Let me, let me see if if there's if yeah. she could. Let me just just check. Just check. Yeah. And is there anything like like a connection on your end maybe that could be a little um, loose? Just... No, it's internet. It's internet That's weather. Internet. I okay. think. Hang on. Internet weather. How weird. That's a internet word. Weather. That's yeah. a phrase. Internet weather. 
That's unfortunate. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready for this world, Elias. <laughs> <laughs> what, what am I even supposed to do? It cleared up as soon as I left, didn't it? Of course. Okay. <laughs> our uh, our housemate isn't streaming anything. The kids aren't watching YouTube videos or whatever. So okay. Well, I will just kind of say it was a glitch and hope it, was, it doesn't hope come for the back. Best. Well, t- get, tell us about um, your your South Shore, or is it is it South Shore? Shore soup. Soup. Yeah. Okay. It, it it is an attempt to knock off a good idea, which was Detroit soup. Detroit soup. They've been doing it for seven or eight years i think a while now yeah 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 they've raised like somewhere between 150 and 200 thousand dollars yeah five dollars at, at a time it's best way they, to do it they have started businesses they mm-hmm. have started nonprofits. they mm-hmm. have started neighborhood projects they have uh started bad ideas that didn't get anywhere <laughs> which yeah. is actually the most important part it is rule, right. rule out yeah make your mistakes early and often and Creative cheaply destruction right yeah. right yeah, yeah. Do and some you know cheap really cool. doesn't you, work. Can, you can go on the Detroit Suit website and download the spreadsheet of every presentation, kind of a little description of it, mm-hmm. uh, the basics that's ever been given. So I don't know what number it is. It's in the hundreds. So and wow. and as you read through them, they are just a spectacular little uh, seedbed of things. Seedbed of ideas, and, right? Yeah, right. And so you know, like I say, many of them do not work, but. Many did, and now soup is an international thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, for some strange reason, it's very popular in the UK. There are oh, many wow. soup soup events in the UK. Mm-hmm. So we did one in Michigan City. We did one in Gary. Uh, we had a nice turnout, and several nice projects got started. And then I realized the missing piece, which I'm still working on, mm-hmm. and that is just as in Detroit, we didn't really have a way – to do kind of a handoff from the soup evening to something else, you know, the incubator. Oh, you got this okay. good idea, but you know, can you do it on your own? Really? Okay. So right. we can we can point you to a few people, but will that be enough? And do you know about how to organize a project? Do you know how to organize a nonprofit? You know, there's all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. So sort of like a support, in- like some support scaffolding. Yeah, the the yeah. follow up, kind of the next phase to really incubate the idea. Some of which was needed, not always, but mm-hmm. we didn't really have it in place. But it just occurred to me that that it seems to me that there needs to be a system where not only do you get great ideas from the neighborhood at the soup, but mm-hmm. then those ideas have a place to go and get developed and mm-hmm. then really put on the road for hopefully longer term. Mm-hmm. So that was that was one thing. And we're not done with that. And Pete Davis, who just graduated from law school, is going back with his shiny uh, law degree mm-hmm. to Falls Church, Virginia. All right. His hometown. Mm-hmm. And his idea, among other things, is to create some kind of a C-lab, uh, maybe even to do soup-like projects. So we're thinking if we had one in Northwest Indiana and one in Falls Church, Virginia, Mm-hmm. Maybe we have the beginnings of something larger. Yeah, that's, so that's we don't know. Yeah. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, open up what a C lab is for our listeners. What, what's, um, what's a C lab? Just it's just my made up term for a community incubator, and by that I mean a place where you create civic entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. so how many of those are there? You know, the answer is what basically none. No, no, but they don't exist. C- civic entrepreneurship, I, I think I invented the phrase, frankly, because mm-hmm. I just can't find it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could call it social entrepreneur, which is pretty much the same thing. Right. Give, uh, give us a for instance. What would that look like? What would a civic, a civic entrepreneur, like a project they, uh, they might, he or she might do? Well, you know, I, that's interesting. I've got sort of two fr- frames of mind about this. My mm-hmm. original one 
was sort of um, a goo-goo idea. The, the term goo-goo comes from Chicago. Mm -hmm. It comes from the old Mayor Daley, who was very annoyed with people who would come up from Hyde Park and want to talk about good government. He hated these people. <laughs> <laughs> he called them goo-goo. The goo mm -hmm. That's all he wanted to talk about was good government. You know, he just wanted to kill them all. Anyway, um, right. so the goo-goo idea is you're, you're uh, a citizen, you're a good person, you want to organize something, you are going to help the city, you're mm -hmm. going to collaborate with City Hall, mm -hmm. and we're going to get something done that otherwise the city would not get around to, doesn't have the budget for, doesn't know how to do. Doesn't even whatever. have the energy for. Yeah. Nah, nah. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, the city being a, the city mm -hmm. is kind of wary. They're going to wait and watch you do it. And if you get it right, then maybe we'll collaborate and probably take all the credit anyway. Yeah, yeah. The right. usual. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what a civic entrepreneur is. Right. Um, I've, I've refined the idea a bit in order to make it a little bit more of a challenge to the city rather than um, – you know, a kind of uh, cheerful sort of Boy Scout kind of collaboration. Right, right. Where it's more like uh, it's it's the citizen who gets bike lanes installed for the first time. Yes, that, that's that's right. the original idea. Right. Sort of tactical urbanism, you right? Know, all that good stuff. It's the person who's like that empty lot. Maybe could be a pocket park. Yeah, yeah, right. and that's great, and that's a whole lot of it. But yeah. I'm I'm thinking I'm I'm learning mm -hmm. that when you look around uh, in Europe, in particular, and other places. There's more going on. There's another. There's another level of this, mm -hmm. and it really has to do with um, the rise of kind of like um, uh, fearless cities. Mm -hmm. Chuck Marone, I believe, was just going to a conference. I think called Fearless Cities. Um, there's also oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. kind of rising cities. Mm -hmm. There is, in fact, when you dig a little deeper, you discover there is a, a very fascinating movement now called municipalism. Mm. And that is what's going on, among other places, in Barcelona, Spain, and in Rojava, Kur Kurdistan. 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 Wow. <laughs> yeah. And so the idea yeah. with municipalism is that, um, is, is it like organizing at the municipal level? Correct. Versus and a federally or on a you know, county or state level? That's right. Okay. It, it is essentially self-organizing communities mm -hmm. uh, that in some ways, and this is where it kind of turned my head around, they, they are organizing in the sense that they are beginning to offer an alternative citizenship. Oh, hey. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, so I first uh, got a signal of this when I learned that in New York, and in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and somewhat to my surprise, in South Bend, Indiana, you can oh, get South Bend. <laughs> a, a citizen, a citizen, uh, a civic ID. Right. Wow. So ID from the from the city. from the municipality from the city. And you you don't even have to be a federal citizen uh, mm -hmm. or even documented. You simply have to be a resident. Right. You live here. You live here, and if if you get a card, you're entitled to certain things no matter what anybody else outside the city might say, which right. is a pretty interesting idea. It's a radical form of home rule, actually. Wow. It is. Yeah. And it is. actually, it sounds like anarchism, but not scary. Well, Correct. I'm, I'm yeah. thinking of, okay, so I hope that doesn't get confused with like the uh, sovereign citizens movement. No, right? no. <laughs> no, no. I, no. It, and here's why. Here's why. Because there's a very important piece of it. There's also a thing called dark municipalism, mm. uh, which is the, you know, the bad stuff. That means, by the way, merely um, autarky. That's how we're self rule. Right. Self rule, right, right. right. No. And, and this, this has to be, this has to be to work confederalism. Right. Which right. means New York and San Francisco and South Bend and everybody else, they're collaborating. They're creating a system amongst themselves. themselves. Hmm. Right. Well, so that's really, uh, that's really interesting. There's a lot of talk and discussion around this. There's a really kind of uh, interesting character who's behind it. Mm -hmm. And in typical Solidarity Hall fashion, mm -hmm. we have to find, you know, kind of a presiding spirit, an intellectual who got all this going. Right. Well, his name is Murray Bookshin. No, oh, Murray yeah, Bookshin. Yeah. And Murray smokes. Bookshin is actually kind of famous yeah. in Kurdistan <laughs> and Rojava. Right? I, I, I don't really yeah. know his work, but I know of him as, right. as an anarchist yeah. writer. And, right, yeah. right, right. 
eco, kind of an eco socialist yeah. guy. But he refined this to the well. He was very inspired by uh, ancient Greek democracy, mm -hmm. and he said, "Really, uh, the world should be run by neighborhood assemblies." Mm -hmm. And so let's do that, and then let's do one in each town, yeah. and then let's connect them. Right. And um, and then there was some other sort of variations added to it, including, by the way, interestingly, a pretty strong flavor of feminism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be what has been going on in Rojava and is now, I understand, really threatened uh, really by the Turkish military. Oh, well, but that? Uh, they they made a lot of progress. They've done a lot of amazing things, as well as in other places uh, in uh, Brazil, Argentina and other places where we pay no attention to what they're doing and can't imagine there'd be anything to learn. <laughs> yeah, anything to learn about that? I don't know. I don't know. It sounds so anyway, communist. Yeah. It sounds yeah. just a little bit like the uh, New England town meeting that's tradition. Right. Yes, that's really, yes. really all we're an expanded that's version of that. Yeah. That's all we're talking about. And then it's not complicated, actually. No, uh, no, no. And then I know that David Byrne has been giving talks uh, called "Reasons to Be Cheerful," and he's talking <laughs> a lot about projects. You mentioned like Rio. Mm -hmm. He's talking about yeah. projects that are actually signs of life and signs of hope uh in yeah. like supporting people in the favelas and the poor communities That's right. yeah and, yeah well I mean, and there's this understanding that favelas are the worst thing that ever happened you know <laughs> um well he doesn't until you turn yeah. one right yeah. right yeah. until you go to one yeah right and you know you think maybe maybe i could live in a favela could that happen? <laughs> maybe? listen they are favelas some of them in rio are now tourist attractions uh -huh. yeah yeah. yeah, they really are great examples of self-organizing communities. Some mm -hmm. of them. This doesn't mean that they are free from all problems. Sure. In particular, as yeah. everybody knows, there's some that have terrible drug problems. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but not all, and not all at the same time. Um, they, at the same time, also are artistic havens. Mm -hmm. uh, there's you know local culture. There's local food. Mm -hmm. um, there is a certain esprit. Uh, you know, kind of an entrepreneurial fizz right. about these places because mm -hmm. the city, the city has always just kind of wished they would blow away. Has yeah. paid them no yeah. attention. Yeah. They just left them. They, they pirate their electricity. Yeah. So when you go through the favela, you take the tour, <laughs> there's all this incredibly scary really? looking wire hanging around. <laughs> yeah. just, yes. You just know we're all about to be electrocuted. <laughs> yeah. You're living on, living on faith. Oh my God. Oh my God. But then they're all up on the hillside of Rio looking down at the bay. Mm -hmm. So the favelas in Rio all have absolutely million dollar views. Million dollar views. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah so, it's, that, that. it's sort of an inverted scheme where the poor people lived up and up, up in the up hills the right. and the wealthy lived down low. And usually it's in the reverse. Yeah, usually yeah, the poor people live in the flood backwards. zone. Yeah, right. right. Well, so, so yeah. maybe, maybe in terms of, uh, you know, happy things to think about, maybe in the coming collapse, um, mm -hmm. whatever it is, whatever uh, it looks like financial, you know, we'll, we'll move in this country toward more of an informal economy, which is yeah. a lovely word mm -hmm. for feeling like you live in a favela. Right. <laughs> right. Well, and I think this is, this is an important point that I, we, we almost kind of raised like twice yeah. here. Um, yeah. Some the thing that I think a lot of people are frightened of when they talk about any of these things on the anarchy yeah. spectrum, yeah. where you know municipalism or you know self organizing communities, favelas, etc. Um, they're like, but what about the drugs? You know, what about the problem? What about the crime? What about the you know infant mortality? What about mm -hmm. what about? And I think this is a really critical piece here. Yeah. You need to understand that what this means is that. Some of the experiments, a lot of the experiments will fail. Mm -hmm. Some of them horribly. Yep. But that's that's part of this territory. Yep. Is that some of the soup projects are not going to go anywhere? That's right. It's a great idea, and you fund it, and it flops. And <laughs> you know, that's how this works. Sometimes, is that sometimes the good great ideas don't go anywhere. No, and well, I was going to say, I mean, what about? the infant mortality in the wealthiest country in the, in the world, world, you know, so, <laughs> that's and, and that's, I was like right. giggling almost. So yeah. people always have those questions and yeah. all these what about. Yeah. And I think on the one hand, 
you have to honestly assess reality and that and accept. Yes, this the doing things this way means there will be failures. Mm-hmm. Some of the failures will be spectacular. Some of them will be tragic. Yeah. But <clears throat> some of the successes will be repeatable. Yeah. No, right. That's yeah. right. And I think when I say that, I'm not just trying to be glib about the failures and the tragedy. What I'm trying, but the flip side of that is we are not willing to admit that we already have failures and tragedies right. with what that's we're right. doing now. Right. No, we have right. grotesque inequalities in what we're doing now. We're this already, is, this is, yeah. This is a little bit like Chuck Marone's small incremental experiments. Yes. It's a little bit like that. A little bit you like know, that. Chuck, and I, I bet Chuck would love this. It's also, as I understand it, like uh, Rosa Luxemburg's preference for the honest mistakes of the working class yes. over the wisdom of the vanguard party. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> Absolutely. Because honestly, I think if we assess honestly yeah. the tragedies and the failures and the real lack of success in what we do now, yeah. if we're honest about it, I think we will see a very difference in the nature and scale of failure when we take little steps and try something new, maybe yep. even something dangerous, yep. and fail. Yep. Right. And it's going gonna, it, gonna to be qualitatively different, and I think quantitatively different as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And by yep. when I say yep. different, I don't mean worse, um, just to be clear, that I think right. taking smaller risks more often right. will actually be better. I, I wonder, is this a little bit like the way that we believe – Mm-hmm. Given, given the right legal system, yeah. we can basically eliminate or certainly manage all risk in society. Yes, we have with, this with result, right? With the result that we have legal anxiety about nearly everything. Nearly mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. You want to have a potluck in your church basement? No, no, no. <laughs> nope. uh, Well, do you have insurance for that? I'm just wondering, is everyone insured? You'll poison or electrocute everybody. Yeah. Right. For We're talking about a potluck in your basement of no. your church. No can do um, No, it can't happen. Well, and that, that sort of space that we've gone into yeah. is perverse. Well, yeah. So that's an informal space. You know, how do you, how would you get to legal informality? It just occurred right. to me. I, I don't know the answer to that. No, it's a good question. It's a, <clears throat> Especially in the United States. The state of Michigan has a problem having... Um, bringing municipalism here, it's a, actually a structural problem at the state level. I believe in the late, oh, I think it was the late 60s. It may have been as early as like 57. Um, Michigan, which people already think of as kind of like the Wild West for some of our legal structure, <laughs> um, revoked something called home rule. Oh, really? Yes. So you can't, you are not legally allowed by the state constitution to do things like Change oh. your stra- your tax structure on oh, a municipal right. level. Right. No, you think, are not allowed to. Indiana, right. Yeah. Indiana also. Right. So there's all these there's multiple layers of things that a city might do. Yes. That we can't do. That's right. It can't happen legally. We're not alone. I think there's some right. other states that have this problem too. Right. It's it's like okay, it's not the feds are getting in the way. It's our damn it's state, state capital. State capital. That's which, already barred the door. Right. Has mm-hmm. already barred it mm-hmm. tight. I mean, yeah. shut tight. So, yeah. and you think to yourself, well, that's great that, you know, you can't do that as a municipality, except um, <clears throat> it prevents all kinds of things like local wage ordinances that's and right. local, yeah. all kinds of things you might yeah. Yeah. approach from a local level. Mm-hmm. It's just off the table. It's totally off the table. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas we have an understanding throughout most of the United States in the back of our heads that, well, you know, all those decisions are going to be at the local level, just like, Oh, those federal decisions, we're going to make those at a state level. And that's yep. not true in the state of Michigan. And actually is something I've brought up at just about every meeting I've gone to is like, so what about changing the little home rule thing? <laughs> just asking. Mm-hmm. Does anybody even know what you're talking about? Uh, occasionally they do. Yeah. All the Republicans know exactly what I'm talking about. The Democrats look yeah. at me like I'm like I have two heads. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, that but, is a noble. That's a noble ambition. Um, so yeah, how about this? Yeah, what about that? Can we put that on the table again? Because I think the impetus was uh, a number of municipalities um, did not want to fluoridate their water. Oh, <laughs> and so the state said you you have to fluoridate yeah. your water. You can't make that rule as a municipality. And so 
and not only that. Right. It, you yeah. can't make any of these yeah. rules yeah. Yeah. as a municipality. <clears throat> um, so all those rules became null and void as soon as they instituted uh, revoked home rule. That is a problem. So it's it's a problem. It's a thing, uh, yeah. and it's really it's the regulatory thing, and that's that's where people are like. But what about all the tooth decay? You know, <laughs> well, what are you going to do then if you it's, revoke home rule? It's not really anymore about the tooth decay. It's not, it's just, <laughs> no, no, it just no. isn't. Yeah, I'm just flashing back to Doctor Strange of uh, polluting our precious <laughs> bodily fluids. There you go. That's <laughs> that's that's that. no. So this reminds me a little bit of a comment yeah. of a millennial friend of mine, Asif Wilson, who was running a alternative. Uh, leadership program over in East Chicago. East Chicago is basically, you know, 10 or 20 square blocks of very low income people yeah. stuck in between the BP refinery oh, God. <laughs> and U.S. Steel. Okay? Wow. It's a really, uh, you know, the name sounds like it might really be something to do with Chicago. It's really just, it's, it's a no man's uh, land. Yeah, probably it's all beat up. It's a, a no I know that. Cancer cluster, too. Yeah, I mean, no, I like, actually, I've driven through there oh, on the highway and I've seen it. Oh, my God. It's, yeah, it's industrial. Yeah. Waste so he gets a grant to come over and take some high school students who uh, are not going to work and they're not going to college. Mm -hmm. And he spends a year uh, giving them Paolo Freire. And a bunch of other great stuff, basically about really being social entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, very wonderful, talented, young African-American guy, just got a PhD in education mm -hmm. and it's gone off to teach somewhere, I guess. Yeah. But I was talking to him about, you know, organizing and stuff like that. And I said, well, you know, it's not exactly like the old days where you get a bunch of people and you go down to City Hall and you bang on the door and you ask for the seat at the table. Yeah. And I'll see if broke into this big smile and he said, no, man. He said, we're not doing that anymore. And I said, really, what are you going to do? He said, well, we're going to go to the other end of the town and we're going to build our own damn table. <laughs> Good move. Good move. I thought, wow, that is exactly what is going on in Detroit. Mm -hmm. That's what needs to go on in Gary. Yeah, and that is what municipalism places. amounts to, you know, right. sort of alternative and I, structures. And it would not surprise me that if these – there are these swaths of Detroit where they're shutting off the lights and the kind of really yeah. just kind of abandoned parts of the city, which right. I think for the city as a whole is probably a good idea, to be honest, right. that right. Um, Detroit has always been too large and too flat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> that's needed to happen. It never should have happened the way it did. That's right. But I would not be shocked or amazed to see people come to the fore and create new municipal structures in those spaces. True. Right? Sort True. of like a, um, a, a inner, inner ring suburb. Yeah. Would, would you know, be birthed mm -hmm. in that space. Yeah. I, I, could, I could see that happening in a couple of places where there's a really strong civic presence yeah. and these folks just don't want to leave. Well, you know? but the problem yeah. being that a lot of them are probably near to brownfields, you know, yes. as far as the what's in the soil. You know? Yeah, mm -hmm. which, which is an ongoing thing in every, in every part of every city. Yeah. And yeah. That's just an yeah. ongoing reality that we really can't uh, turn, look away from. And on the one hand, we can't look away from it, but on the other hand, we have to figure out how to live with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Live with it, live alongside it. We can't just abandon Because all these cities, all, every American city, is in the best place possible. It's in the best geographic location possible. Just because that's where it was built there for a reason. It was built there for a reason. Historically. Yeah. Historically. Yeah. And yeah. that reality has not changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. right? I mean, until, I don't know, California falls into the ocean. <laughs> Exposing right? some new. Exposing some, some new, new waterfront. Sea, sea routes. Yeah. Uh, you know, until oh, there's right. some that's kind right. of cataclysmic physical change to the geography. That's yeah. just reality. Right, right, and so we have to figure out how to live with these places. It's still about who has access to water, shipping, and and um, etc. And the roads, yeah. and mm -hmm. etc. All those things, yeah. and um, that's not going to change. Which is why it's been so important for these municipalities, as they sort of like move through their decay process, to to wait out the hanger-ons who are poor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because um, how should I say? That's the best land. The You're just waiting for it to become open. Oh, the location <laughs> is intrinsically valuable. It has intrinsic value. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, mm. so that'll be interesting to see how that shakes. And I think 
Detroit and the people in it have, the people who, especially the people who have stayed, have what it takes mm. to build new tables. And, you know, start again. Yes, yes. And just start, you know, with something new where they are. Yeah. Um, so that's that'll be interesting to watch unfold. And it's one of the things I kind of expect to happen, you know, mm-hmm. as uh, like uh, what we were talking in last week, last week's podcast about how um, Detroit is this, Detroit and Michigan are this needle the entire United States has to pass through yeah. where we have yeah. to figure it out. Yeah. How are we going to use these huge industrial cities? How are we mm-hmm. going to live with them? How are we going to live in them? Mm-hmm. Um, and the populations that are there, that are there already. How are we going to do it? Not everyone can move to Austin and become a software engineer. No, right. That, right. That, that can't happen. And also, what are we going to do about losing... I was talking with someone else. I was talking with Joy today about um, losing the, the brain drain that happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where, yeah. you know all the so-called best and brightest leave the community. Yeah. How do you function then? How do you, and really the truth is they have to come back. Right. Right. Because if you think about it, like, you know, like some of these towns, these, these sort of rural towns, uh, or even like um, um, sort of off the path cities like Saginaw. Mm-hmm. So you take the entire graduating class from your public high school. You take the entire graduating class from your private high school. And the top 10%, the kids with the most charisma, the most talent, and the, the most sort of uh, gifts, they mm-hmm. are also the same 10% that the community has invested the most in. That's right. That's right. Literally, the blood, sweat, <clears throat> and tears yep. of the community are yep. in those children. Yep. Mm. And they pack up wow. and they leave and they never come back. The meritocrats. Yes. So every right. year, it's another dramatic loss yeah. of the community's most cherished investment. No, right, right. So <clears throat> I, I, I think the only rational answer is to stop sending that investment away. Yes. Like literally just giving it to New York and San Francisco and Austin. For yeah. Michigan, it was Chicago. It was typically. Chicago. Yeah. So yeah, we no, create yeah. desirable places in some Precisely. Way. It has to be a place yeah. you want to stay. It has to you be know, a place that's worth staying. I, I was just talking to Paul about this because, you know, in Indiana, I, I've got a friend – a guy that just retired from uh, Indiana University of Bloomington, mm-hmm. where he was an economic historian. And one of his specialties was the state of Indiana itself, actually. Mm. And he was very intimately aware of all this data around economic development and all the different communities around the state. And as I was talking to him about my various little schemes, mm-hmm. he said, you know, we need to figure out what is the population number below which you are not coming back. Mm. That there, it's the, like the th- point of no return. The, the, yeah, the, the community's so, not coming back, or people aren't coming not, back. Do what you want. Have the all city the can't, you can't want. function. Oh, have right. All the neighborhood parties. There's no neighborhood. You, it's all gone. It's gone. You do not have what it takes. You're just going to have to let go. You know, right. there's some threshold number. Right. There is. It's got to be. And I, I think we could almost imagine what the number is. It's probably. I'm thinking maybe around 10,000, 15,000. I don't know how below that you can do it. For a city? And, and it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. not sure if it's a number per se as much as it is a density level. Right. It could right. be a density oh, level. Because right. uh, I was be thinking that number yeah. for a neighborhood is 300 individuals. For a neighborhood. For a neighborhood. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. That yeah. could be. Yeah. It seems this, like, this I was just saying to Paul. Oh, sorry. This, this is part of the problem with Saginaw is that mm-hmm. the way it's collapsed is that it's now... Um, just a scattered enclaves and right. the downtown does oh, exist but it's all missing teeth and a lot of the neighborhoods that have emptied out are now filled with <clears throat> decaying abandoned houses and, and so some there's still people, but not yeah there's not still mass. people living there but yep. now there's like all the spaces in between them like, are empty that, right. that also describes gary indiana uh-huh. yeah yeah same thing same thing very difficult with no density. With no, exactly. I mean, yeah. Because there's fifty thousand people there. Right. But yeah. They yeah. don't have. They don't get to know their neighbors. They don't have any no. functional interaction with each other. Now, what, we, really what was it you were telling Paul earlier? Oh, about I thought there was. I, I came up with this idea. That there's probably maybe three ingredients, mm-hmm. and if you are missing one, you're probably not going to make it. Right. So one one is I think your town probably needs to have some bones. 
It needs to look mm-hmm. like something. And there mm-hmm. are actually towns around me here in, in North of Indiana that do, really do not have a downtown. It's not a yeah. place. Or, so what, what is this thing? You know? some, some of those towns I saw like going through Virginia and places like that where there is yeah. an old downtown. That's right. It's oh, where yeah. this, it's where the Civil War monument is. Oh, right. yeah, right. And, and, and you drive through and you think, could we, could we have this? You know? Yeah, but it's not <laughs> functioning as a downtown anymore. Nope. There's some right. kind of a civic thing, a couple, That's like right. a municipal building a couple miles away. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, so, and then so the second ingredient is some kind of economic activity. Something has Something. to be going on. Right? Yeah. And, and, and then the third thing I think mm-hmm. is there needs to be some history of local families and others mm-hmm. being civically involved. Right. And so if you're missing one of those three, I just, I just don't know how you're going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like the, uh, the economic element too, a lot of these towns there, there is some economic activity going on, but what mm-hmm. is going on mm-hmm. are only the businesses that are feeding off the last remnant of the money yeah. of the people who are stranded there. Yeah. That yeah, is right. the, the, the diabetes centers, the, the, uh, the <laughs> infusion, what do they call that? Um, Oh, those uh, infusion centers. Yeah, the mm-hmm. where, um, dialysis dialysis centers. Yeah, yeah. And Jeez. where, like, as because the people who are stranded there, retired, many of them are still collecting Some Social kind Security of and Social pension, Security. and they're and they get no, Medicaid, right. and so right. there's there's our businesses that can can uh, um support can, themselves on their their Medicaid right. money, yep. but. Right. But that's uh, unless that town is also growing. <laughs> that's, that's not that's, sustainable. There, there's long-term. a horizon, you know. Now here's here's my question, and how I think just about every distributist that I know is the question mm-hmm. I have that that brought me in contact with them. I'm mm-hmm. still asking this question. <laughs> Are we talking about GM as the economic activity? Mm-hmm. And I'm using GM as a stand-in. Sure. Mm-hmm. Are we talking about a large and a sing- large singular industrial employer? Are we talking about... Everyone gets an Amazon warehouse. <laughs> or are we talking about um, a, a particular industry? Is like it, our town's a tourist town. This is what we do. You know, yeah. Are we talking about... Um, or are we talking about an economy, a local economy that serves the needs of the people that live there for all their needs? Very good question. Yeah. Because that's, that's the question mm-hmm. that I think really breaks the bank right there because yeah. if we're talking about gm jesus yeah that's not going to work mm-hmm. it works for gm yeah mm-hmm. well mm-hmm. saginaw's yeah. history is a boom and bust cycle right, right. before it was, it was it was gm it was a lumber industry. it was the industry oh. yeah. it yeah. was the lumber yeah. industry when the trees were gone the industry mm-hmm. left yep mm-hmm. and before that it was beans yep. and after they mm-hmm. stripped the soil well, I think I may have reversed that. I think it was lumber, and then the trees were gone, so they okay. planted beans. Oh, and then the soil was, you know, rep- you know uh, deplenished. Yeah, but it was a, it was a single. It was a, a basically a monoculture. A monoculture of industry. Yeah. Like they, where there's a big, um, we see the t-shirts for Saginaw. They've got a bunny on them. Yeah. For the bunny hmm. beans. Bunny beans. Uh, like it's seriously, a, seriously. Ele- elevator. Elevator. A bean elevator, like a grain elevator, but for oh, beans. Right, 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 right. And at one point. In That's the great. world's history, I think eighty percent of all the beans on the planet came through Saginaw, Michigan. Like some crazy, like There's absurd a f- factoid. Interesting factoid. For you. Absurd How factoid bizarre. that you know it was not just all beans, but like uh, nor- great northern beans. Yeah. All, and, like they were supplying and, armies, right? Like mm-hmm. all their you know navy beans came from Saginaw, Michigan. And so, young, young Theodore Rethke was standing there watching those beans. Watching his beans go. <laughs> he, spent most, he spent most of his time watching the greenhouses. Yeah. That was the other thing. Yeah. There were all these greenhouses yeah. that produced oh. flowers, vegetables, et cetera, year-round for the city. Yeah. Those are gone now. So wow. you think to yourself, how did Saginaw eat through the winter in yeah. 1900? Greenhouses. Huh. Because like I said, it's it's <clears> the... <throat> It's the coldest, northernmost, like large, reasonably large sized city, city in Michigan. In the state, in the state. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Past yeah. that, it's like there are there are towns mm. like Cadillac, Cadillac and places Marquette. like that, but they're yeah, Holton. Marquette, but they're considerably smaller. Considerably smaller, yeah, like half a quarter of the size. And so, yeah. um, what you end up with? So, if if it's an industry, you know that industry can collapse. Mm-hmm. If it's uh, a specific employer, 
when things aren't going Mark, their way, market conditions, the market or, conditions change, they will leave. They lose their tax yeah. incentives. That's a big one. They go. Um, and I think the only one of those economic engines or activity things is if you have an economy serving the needs of the people there, feeding yeah. them, housing them, clothing them, etc. And so absent that, you're looking at this very fragile economic situation. Yep, sure. Yep. You're just more neoliberal extraction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, that's really the thing. It is literally just extraction. Yeah. GM came and extracted labor. Yep. After we'd extracted the lumber, after we extracted yeah. the soil uh, health, and so on. Part, and so, yeah. Part of the reason we are still burdened with the house, the old house, besides, mm -hmm. you know, the mark, the economic conditions economic for conditions, selling right. a house are is the result of a couple other industries that um, didn't pay their fair share of the wreckage they did. Asbestos. Asbestos and lead. lead. Right. Oh so yeah. lead oh paint and asbestos insulation. Yeah. Right. They're all, you know, it, people made bank on it yeah. for decades and then were like, oh, that's actually not safe. And they were legally protected. Legally enjoined from having to... You know, yeah, and then deal 40, with the 45 minutes away, wow. the employer that I had for a while, Dow Chemical, mm -hmm. is still fighting a legal mm -hmm. battle to avoid actually starting the process of cleaning up the sure. the whole river, yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> which is pristine mm -hmm. north of the Dow. The Dow, yeah, plant. yeah. Huh. I mean, it's really it's oh. some of the best water in the state north yeah. of wow. the Dow plant. <clears throat> South of it, you can't eat the fish. <sighs> Jeez. I mean, people do. Mm -hmm. So when we bought the but house, yeah, we got all this safe. paperwork about how our the whole area was was contaminated with dioxin. So. From that, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So oh. that's and mind you, that's the those are the specifics in Saginaw. I'm sure Gary has a story. Oh, oh sure. Yeah. Detroit yeah. has lots of stories. No, it's just oh, yeah. this was right. This was played out, like you said, right. extraction <laughs> and then exploitation and failure. Of the industries to actually clean up the the damage, any of the damage, right. and so, there, so it's twofold. On the one hand, it's fragile; it's not a good idea for your local economy. Mm -hmm. And on the to other hand, a, to have a single employer, to have a single yeah. employer right. or a single right. industry, yeah, mm -hmm. right. Um, and on the other hand, so now on the one hand, it's economically fragile; it's just a bad idea, right? And I think any mm -hmm. of us, you know, kind of looking at the numbers, can just see that plain as day. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's also sort of like a, I want to say immoral, you know, to do this kind of extraction mm -hmm. yeah. and destruction sure. of a place. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's twofold. It's not just a poor economic equation. It's not just immoral. It's yeah. all mm -hmm. these things at once. And no wonder all these cities look this way. No, right. It's after this. Economic, economic strip mining. Yeah. yeah it's, mm -hmm. Just stripping away at every mm -hmm. turn. I mean, what else would you expect the city to look like after that's done? Yep. yep. Yeah. Yep. You know, a friend of mine is about, I think, to run for mayor in Valparaiso. Awesome. He is also a big Strong Towns fan. Amen. So he wrote up his first position paper. He's, he's still kind of queasy about doing this. <laughs> and frankly, <laughs> these days... To run for public office probably would make anyone queasy. I, but, yeah. But, yeah. But he, he came right out and he said, you know, we were, we're all excited about a proposed $75 million transportation district, <clears throat> transportation oriented district project. I, I don't even think the damn thing ought to be built. And he sort of goes into a strong towns song right. and dance. Nice. And, nice. and I want to, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a coffee with him tomorrow and and i'm kind of an informal advisor mm -hmm. but i want to say you know bill i i don't think you can say this <laughs> <laughs> i'm not well chuck i just don't think this is i mean i think this is right of course yeah. but right. i think you're going to have to talk about something else you're going to have to do what pete Buttigieg did in south bend and just talk about innovation all the time you know <laughs> right that's the right. only thing to talk about because everybody thinks that sounds great you know yeah. whatever that is now, right. chuck, that chuck learned that actually criticizing his own um, you know, a profession what had consequences. Yeah. Oh, no, not had good, real no. consequences. Yeah. Get real trouble. consequences. No, right. You get in right, trouble. Right. Real but trouble. The problem is the problem is you know this economic development debate. Right. Um, right. You know, people think of it as two different things. The, the the thing we've been doing, particularly at the local level, where it really does not work, mm -hmm. and that is called economic hunting. Yes. And you go out and you try to bag some big game. 
right? Yeah. And and when they move here, they're going to hire us all, and everything it's will going to be great, right? And we spend a lot of money doing this, and then it doesn't happen, you know. And or the they jilt us, they jilt us, and then they move away, right? Um, the, but the alternative, which we don't seem to get, is economic gardening. No, no. And and we're oh. learning about this because <laughs> nice. we just had a big, we just had a big employer here in Valparaiso that had been around for decades mm -hmm. and put a ton of money into the city. And they said one morning, you know, we've decided we're going to move just across the county line. Oops. Better for business. And everybody, oh my God, you're going to do what? <laughs> what? You know? Yeah. So, so um, what we should have been doing was spending money convincing them, no, 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 no. You need to stay exactly where you are because it's just going to get better. And, and mm -hmm. not only this one, you know, big employer, but all the other small to medium sized businesses where right. we should have been gardening and right. keeping these people around, you know, for the, for, for the, the long haul yeah. social texture, you know? Right. Right. Well, and but I, yeah. People don't get that. They don't, they don't get, get that at all. Well, well that and, was, with yeah. the tax break situation, if <clears> you've <throat> given away everything you've got to give, You've right. got no. You're you're starting out in a pretty bad negotiating position. Yeah. You're coming coming to Amazon or whoever yeah. is a beggar, yeah, and then right. when they're like, "Hey, how about a little something down the road mm -hmm. just to Crazy. keep?" You know, this I is know. a nice little local economy you've got going here. It'd be a shame if something were it to happen to, to it. it. Just you've, saying. you've got nothing. You have no bargaining chips at all. You've got no chips. Well, and I think part of that that frame of economic gardening is. Mm. This idea, back to this idea that some of these are not going to make it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Some yeah. of your plants yeah. are going to, you know, they're not going to make it. Right. And, you know, it's okay. Well, in this, in mm -hmm. the Strong Towns uh, blog, and, and uh, I know in Chuck's talks, he used to talk about, like, how about ins instead of, you know, spending $75 million on this civic development project, we sp we spend, you know, 7500 yeah, 7, you know, a hundred times or something, or right. or yeah. seventy-five. Yeah. You know, yeah. like right, and, a thousand times. And then mm -hmm. many of those, like even things like bike lanes and parking spaces and flowers and you know whatever these simple like uh, little things, little things that change the way people perceive yeah, and no, use a right. streetscape right. Right. was yeah. a huge win, that's and right. it cost all. It was a, a pittance. It a pittance was, by you know, comparison. Yeah. Right, and so yeah. even if you know a hundred, if, if ninety of those projects fail, you've still spent less. Well, you spent <laughs> a lot far less, less, and you've got ten successes instead of That's one. Right. Yeah, That's and these huge how great economic you know, lots of small right? Lots of small and bands. I think yeah. there's um, a friend of mine <laughs> online is now championing how um, things are better now than they ever have been. Mm -hmm. That that sort of space, and it, it feels like a like uh, economic libertarian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, because you know our GDP is so high, and you know mm -hmm. infant mortality is so low, and on, on and on and on, right? Yep. yep. And those numbers are all moving in the wrong direction, and and you can't GDP doesn't mean anything. But well, it, anyway. it's yeah, it's right. it's just you know it's fairy tale, but 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 yeah, that's the frame people are using when they that's talk the about that's the frame success. Right. And I think right. part of it is, um, he he described it as, as ideological, part mm -hmm. of it is philosophical. Because yeah. I don't think raising the GDP by treating cancer 10 times yeah. is a, better. A win. I don't think right. that's a win. Right, right, right. I, I think lowering the GDP and not having anyone with cancer, yeah. that would be a win. No, I mean, you know, right, yeah. defense contractors are huge uh, economic boons if, huge economic if they take Absolutely. out all the externalities. Yeah, yeah. Right? So yeah. those are the questions you've got. I mean, and you you can engage this argument, and you if you get lost in the weeds of the numbers or how many more people are dying or, or fewer, how mm -hmm. many more infants survive childhood, and so on. That's you right. can get lost in those weeds, but the real conversation is about the philosophy underpinning the definition of success. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us have an intuitive understanding of success, and we see it when we drive through a functioning city. Yeah, right. And we know it when we're looking at it. Yes, that's right. Right. And then, yeah. and we know it when we, when we don't see it that maybe the city kind of is dying or is, has passed. Yeah. Right, yep. but none of us can articulate the philosophy that would put the numbers to it, where yeah. you can turn it into an index. Yeah, 
And to some extent, I feel like that's almost a folly to try and turn that into an index. When it's very much this thing that you know it when you see it. Well, you know, yeah. from uh, Christopher Alexander, the, the the guy who wrote about architecture and design patterns, yes. uh, I don't like to talk about the quality without a name, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it's everywhere in huh. classic buildings and our most beloved parks and public spaces and yes. monuments yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. But it's very difficult. I mean, he spends a lot of pages trying, pages to, articulate trying to articulate what it, it is. <clears throat> and I think it's, I appreciate his work doing that. Yes. But to some degree, it's really folly. Yeah. yeah. Because human beings know it when they see it. They do. Then that, That's right. sort of his, almost his definition. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, a friend of mine here in town, our town, keep in mind, is just a little over 30,000 people. He, mm-hmm. He's a real committed progressive. Mm-hmm. And he's very angry at the town fathers, because he believes that there is some sort of ideological, uh, almost conspiracy Mm. about doing things the wrong way. And I occasionally try to make the point to him that it is very much not about ideology in our town, really, Mm -hmm. not in any conscious way. It is a whole lot about people going to high school together. Yes. (laughs) Okay. Yes. At our level, at yeah, our scale yeah. of 30,000 people, I think that is most of it. It's right. got to do with familiarity. Right. Yeah. Right. Because yeah, I don't think point. any of these people s- spend any time worrying about ideology and would not have any idea what in the world you're talking about. What even ideology they're talking about. Correct. Right. right. Now, having said that, um, I want to add that the other little project for, well, Solidarity Hall, c'est moi, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, is I have gotten a press pass for next week to attend the Socialism 2018 conference in Chicago. Well, all right then. Oh, cool. So how do you like them, Apple? <laughs> yeah. I'd, like to, I'd like to be there. <laughs> I'd like to be there. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I think it's going to be really a fascinating scene. I, you know, I have a very strongly sympathetic twinge, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at the program, and I'm struck by the fact uh, of how much of it is really um, sort of um, educational, historical, it, it yeah. reminds me of kind of the old days when there were teach-ins hmm. on mm-hmm. campus yeah. and the young grad student would go out and, and begin by explaining what colonialism was in Vietnam. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just get some of the basics straight, guys. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. Right. Here's where this all came from. You know, Same thing. This is a bunch mm-hmm. of millennials, a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to, you know, the history of the Haymarket riots and, you know. And so, so on. Right. And so on and so on and so on and so on. What I really am interested in, this is four days, by the way, four days. Oh, man. And there's a, there's a ton of identity stuff, which, mm-hmm. some of which I'm sure will be very good. Mm-hmm. Um, and some interesting writers will be there. Nobody's super famous. But what I'm really looking it's for, I don't know if it's going to be there, mm-hmm. is much in the way of discussion of economic root causes. Mm. So there, I'm sure neoliberalism will come up pretty frequently, but will there be really much analysis? analysis or uh, you know, that. much you can put your teeth into, or is it going to stay kind of on the surface and kind of issue oriented rather than trying to drill a little deeper? Right. Um, I, I don't know. So we'll see. Now, we're going to have to have you back on now. Yeah, we need to follow up <laughs> follow a follow up, up report. Yeah. Okay, what I what I saw at the socialism conference. Yay! Yeah. Uh, what I did with my summer. We have such yeah. a such a huge reading list, piles of books uh, on our. Yeah, oh and, like and yeah. so one of the you mentioned identity issues, and one of the the books we've got is um, Asa Hader's book huh. on mm-hmm. identity politics. Right. Uh, it's called Mistaken Identity. Mistaken Identity. And oh, it's a it's huh. a short book, and I have only read the first chapter, and but I found it pretty fascinating. I think it's worth it. I've only, I've only kind of scratched yeah, the surface too. Yeah, we've got to we've got to dive into that, <laughs> and then we're. Mm-hmm. We were, last a uh, couple of shows ago, we were talking with our friend Chris about um, this uh, Melinda Cooper's book on the history of the family and how how uh, American policy was tailored to define and and aid and harm families. <laughs> families, right? The yeah. Sort of huh. nuclear nuclear family. I see. As a I see. subset. But we, yeah, we really huh. want to we really want to talk about the, the identity yeah, yeah. book because. 
Grace describes it as, you know, she's not opposed to identical or identical identity politics. She's yeah. opposed to the cynical abuse of identity, identity politics. politics. Yeah. And Which so is all much, I kind of see. So much right. of it that right. I see, especially from the stemming from the 2016 election, which we're still litigating at every right. <laughs> turn, right. Right. Is, is that cynical, cynical and, identity, is cynical yeah. misuse of identity. I, I, I see another, I see another hopeful sign. Mm -hmm. um, Alexandria ocasio Cortez. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, we were very excited about that. Yeah, I was not, glad to see it. it's a good, it's a fresh, but just a it's a good new direction. Absolutely. Right. Not only not only is she something that nobody practically ever heard of a democratic mm -hmm. socialist. Right. Did you notice she's a practicing Catholic? I did. <laughs> How I about did. it? Yeah. I'm all over it. It's all right. Yeah. That's all right. I, I am so hopeful that she, given the pull of the media and the way you know she's a darling, she's already mm -hmm. a darling. Right. And she's going to become even more darling. I think she can step up to that. Right. She's going to become some kind of uh, media-driven counterfoil to, as I refer to him, the incumbent. The incumbent. <laughs> I think so. I, well, what I, I, I really, yeah, I am excited. Great? I am excited by I've this heard. prospect that millennials yeah. seem to be embracing the yep. DSA. And yes. yep. that's. Yep. I'm not exactly entire. Don't feel like I'm entirely congruent with everything the DSA does. But they're a broad. Yeah. You know, a, a, yeah. they yeah. they work for broad goals. You know, and, uh, they and try frankly, to be a big ten. There's a lot they do that I really appreciate. Right. 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 I, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, chastened. By the fact that I think it's great that she won a primary yeah, in a strong yeah. uh, district that will likely elect her yeah. to Congress. Mm -hmm. I would like to have seen six more going oh, to Congress yeah. this fall. Yeah, That's oh, yeah. what I would yeah. really like to see in November is oh, say yeah. like six yeah. or seven or eight of her in Congress. And then I think we can open up a new space in our political conversation. Yeah. You know what? I did, I did see three or four. Yeah. I did see three right, or four. Right. It is, uh, it is article happening. article listed... Uh, and I think they're all women. I believe they're yes, practically all yes. women. So that was that was good. What I really think Sorry, is going to be curious for me mm -hmm. about the conference is the fact that in in a lot of ways, I get the sense that practically nobody really knows what this word socialism means anymore. No, it's just it's just a boogaboo. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. bah, right. socialism. Or, it's under or your a banner, bed. Or a banner. Pe people and, spent you know, so many years red baiting that they never even bothered to learn right. anything no, no, about no, that true. history. There, right. There's, there's that group. And then there's the younger group that says, yes, we love this word. Actually, we're not really very clear on what's supposed to happen. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. it's a good word. It's different than it's what we're word. doing. Well, I, so, basically, it's different than what we're doing. <laughs> that's right. That is, that's the key thing. That's the key thing. Well, so the beauty of that is, I mean, the disadvantage is, as you know, nobody knows where anything came from. So right. we don't have much cultural historical memory, except among a few people and a few older types. Yeah. That's what the word really means. But on the plus side, that may mean we're free to reinvent it. I think so. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's great. Which is nice. Because if you think about terms and phrases like conservative and yeah. pro-life, yeah. and these words um, are, are really having a funeral right now. Mm -hmm. They really are. Yeah. It's it's sad, actually. It is sad. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Well, maybe that's a good thing. Yeah, maybe I, you know, thing. I just realized this is kind of weird. Today, I was going through my library, mm -hmm. which is not really humongous. It's not on the pot scale. Let's put it that way. <laughs> hey, <you know. laughs> um, but I was going scale. through, and I, I realized once in a while, I don't know how many times in a lifetime, mm -hmm. you say, you know, I don't believe this anymore. <laughs> yeah, you're like I'm not. Oh, yeah, I'm not well, I, I, yeah. I, this isn't me anymore. I I remember when I bought this. I remember what I was thinking. No, I yeah. don't think this anymore. I, well, I don't need this. We are to to put it in perspective. We are woefully overdue to do a big purge of big the Potts purge. Library. You know that would be well. a fun thing. We should advertise it on the Potts Cast. And we should do it on the front lawn. <laughs> we should do that this fall. Well, I keep saying as we as we uh, get rid of books, we should offer them to people. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. that could be nice too. We could also just give it away. That's true. Yeah. And really, on our front line, we would just be giving it away. Just come and get a book. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. ten. Yeah. yeah. And then there'll sad. be like little kits. I'll, I'm also going to prepare kits of books to hand out to every passersby. You know. Ah, like you need to read this. Just yeah. promise me you'll read it and you can have it. Yeah, that, that was books. Now, you, you guys, because of your interest in popular culture, you guys have some stuff that would be definitely valuable to anybody that had been paying any attention. I and I know so. without any doubt, you'll have stuff that is so esoteric that nothing oh. other than the occasional 
poli sci PhD. Yeah, even yeah. Grace's uh, some of Grace's stuff is pretty esoteric. They're pretty esoteric, yeah. yeah. But, but we're yeah, trying really, to make it. Is, that's really what cool. we're trying to do is make it less esoteric. A little less <laughs> right, esoteric, right. just a little bit less. I mean, yeah. I think well, it's good to have a, a focus, but yeah, you know. But your interests change, you know, your outlook changes. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're a really old guy like me, you've gone through a number of different mental revolutions. Yeah. And if you're still hauling around some of those books, you're thinking, oh my God, what am I thinking? What am I even doing here? Yeah. It's, I, it's know, funny how, how much as I'm, I'm just, I'm 50 and how much I'm now basically enjoying a lot of classics more, oh, sure. more sure. than I ever did when I tried to read them when yeah. I was younger. Yeah. And not even, they don't even all have to be old classics, you know, like, right. yes, I did read the kids Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was good. Or part of it. Part of it, yeah. They weren't ready it. for the whole thing. No. Even better than advertised, huh? See? Yeah. 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 And, uh, and that's a book I love and I've read several times. But even things like, I, I'm deep into the New York Review Books classics. Oh yeah, uh, they publish stuff. a lot of stuff that's uh, it's not all stellar, but it's stuff that's disappeared. That's that's yeah. d- vanished from print. And they're bringing stuff back into print. And I find mm-hmm. amazingly, intriguingly weird mm-hmm. books like Hadrian the Seventh. You know, the the man that right. became Pope accidentally. Oops, <laughs> he's the yeah. Pope. Just fantastic imaginative stories. Right. But these days, I'm also reading uh, a whole lot of books that are part of the. Um, Penguin Deluxe uh, Illustrated Classics, their oh, trade they're, paperbacks. But they're beautiful mm-hmm. to hold and, and to see. Honestly, that's a good chunk of why I I pick them up is that um, they're just they have great illustrations. They're often oh. very sardonic about the content. The illustrations are closely related to the content, content. but it's in a in a way where it interprets it or criticizes it in some oh, way. Right. It's very funny, and um, so we read a bunch of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Was Mo- was Moby Dick one of those editions? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I thought you mentioned that. Okay. Yeah. yeah that was uh, and there's one other thing. I don't know if you guys have this experience. I was trying to describe it to my daughters, mm-hmm. and I was saying to them, "I have two in college," and I said, "You know, let me tell you why you're there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> your, your, your job. Now write this down. Your job is to find the teachers that are really spectacular, really thoughtful." And I, I don't mean entertaining. I mean, they're just, mm-hmm. there's going to be a mm-hmm. few people, and you've got to figure out where they are. It really doesn't matter too much what they're teaching. No. You just got to find yeah. them and hang out with them and figure out what are they about. Mm-hmm. And, and then I said, you know, you, you may adopt some of their ideas and maybe even their worldview. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a few of these. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you a strange thing, and that is in many ways – I no longer really believe or agree with a lot of what they were teaching mm-hmm. me in mm-hmm. some cases. It right. has taken me years to work through that. <laughs> to like um, it, to like go beyond what what they actually shared with you. Yeah. Yeah. To so the which, point which, where you could look put it in context. That's right. That's yeah. right. I, and in some ways I still have enthusiasm mm-hmm. for yeah. many aspects of it. And at the same time, I can stand back and say, well, but I, I do not at all believe X, Y, or C. You mm-hmm. know? So, but that process is a very important, engrossing intellectual exercise. And, and if you do that, you're going to love college. You're going to love what it's going to do for you. Right. So try, try to yeah. get to that as soon as you can. You get know? to that space. Right. The, the big thing that I got was this, really uh, thinking back, it was a, being in a very privileged position, honestly. Of mm-hmm. basically having all my material needs met for long enough that I really could just like I, I, yeah. I, I could pick and choose to some extent. You know, yeah. I did have to get my major <laughs> and try to finish in four years, but like uh, I I took classes in um, the the medieval um, mystery plays. Mm-hmm. I took uh, you know and. A, I would show up and it would be a seminar class with uh, six students, you know, right. and yeah. we would, yeah. we're studying the, uh, the Wakefield uh, second shepherd's play and the, and the whole, yeah, you know, yeah. all the, and medieval literature just absolutely fascinated me, yeah. you mm-hmm. know, and not everyone in, even in this uh, rarefied small group was there honestly really into it. Mm-hmm. But the ones that were made it worthwhile. I took That's a, mm-hmm. I audited a seminar uh, on uh, Joyce's Ulysses, 
Oh, that, wow. One of the, I wasn't even taking the class for credit. I missed a lot of them, but the teacher knew me because I had been in uh, some of her classes before. Right. And a couple times she opened up the the floor and said, why don't you give this lecture? Right. Really? <laughs> and right. I yeah. did it. <laughs> Wow, you know, exactly. Goes, that's great. Yeah, that's great. That was a that was a wonderful that's experience. Great. A wonderful experience. Yeah. yeah. And you know, all some of the, <clears throat> the computer science projects too, maybe not as relatable to most people, but you know, where we'd have team projects and some big challenging projects and I'd go we we just like work round the clock, you wow. know. Right. And yeah. uh do these uh, heroic achievements which, you know, to talk to people now who are in computer science and they've never done systems as difficult, as, as difficult, challenging, challenging as those were. So. Yeah, right. This is the kind of theme that uh, our friend Michael Martin uh, oh, writes yeah. and talks about, you know. Yeah. But I, I, I can remember there's a point where finally I sort of caught fire a little bit in the way that you're just describing. Mm -hmm. And I, I practically reached the point where I just, I couldn't wait to wake up in the morning and get back at it, you know. Uh -huh. Right, right. Yeah. It's so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, and I think tasting that energy once carries yeah. you for a long time. It does. Long time. It really does. I, I taught it really a does. class at Saginaw Valley State University. They were, you know, clearly scraping the bottom of the barrel to hire me as an adjunct. But no, they they couldn't find qualified people in the region to teach um, system software. Mm -hmm. They were huh. short. They didn't have enough instructors. So I did this thing as an adjunct. And I, it was a real different experience and, and frustrating in many ways because I would was tr really trying to challenge the students and a handful of them did well. But a number of them, I would get to this point where you could see they were like almost getting it and they were wrestling with some kind of difficult ideas in computer yeah. science. And they, uh, they'd they come to office hours or come to meet me at the library and they looked always so panicked. And, <laughs> yes, yes. And what I was trying to convey to them and that I couldn't convey to them because our experiences in school were so so, so, so divergent now is yeah. that feeling of like, I've almost got it. It's frustrating me. You should uh -huh. live in that feeling. That's you, the spot you're going you for. You should spot. embrace yeah. that feeling. That, right. That's, that's your clue right. to push on through. To keep pushing. Right. But because their circumstances were different maybe they were getting more too far into debt there's more riding on it there's right. more yeah. you know yeah. there's just just more personal like urgency to them getting through this mm -hmm. and they could not accept like the sense of risk that they wouldn't get it they wouldn't get right. it right and it right. just terrified them and i felt so bad because i was trying to help them have this experience that was like the best that came out of my education right. but i get the feeling now that by not just sort of signing everyone an a you know i was really just tormenting many of them mm. right mm -hmm. that, that was not how the, that's not how the game is played anymore that their, their lives just didn't give them the space that we all had at one point yeah. right but to, i to do know that. i mm -hmm. do know that i actually conveyed the material because a handful of students did run with it you know yeah, right a Got handful it and took it. really yeah. and, and had a good time you know yeah. but um but yeah there was this this sort of middle group of students that that were in pain you know they're and really I, struggling mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. good way yeah and that's what like higher education seems to me now is largely so many people just like it's the new high school and yeah, it's like this it. is your bare yeah. minimum hurdle you yeah. have to clear Painful. and you have to borrow a hundred thousand dollars to do it or even just 25 you or know? even just well yeah the number you know the number can be proportional to right your income or what in your eventual income but it right. can still be ridiculous or just a ridiculous can, number a ridiculous yeah. burden yeah. Right. <clears throat> but so yeah i don't know it's it's That's hard well and this is and this was my uh, take on the college experience. There's like the uh, what we like it to be for. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What we think it should be for. Yeah. And like what it is actually for. <laughs> like what it's designed for. Uh -huh. And um, 
my big takeaway was that college was about um, finding those connections and networks that will then sort of take you the other places you're going to go. Yeah, That's Grace it. explained to me why uh, it was years and years after I graduated. She explained to me what was actually going on with all those social events and trips and Stuff. events and things like that, and even right. the sports. Yeah, she's like, "This is here's let me okay, let me explain this here. I'll take you here, here's why that all was, well, happening. was happening." Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. "Oh." It wasn't really for me, was it? The no, kid from the trailer park who didn't know anyone. You. It's not for you. Yeah. It's it, exact. It's precisely what you were talking about a few minutes ago, mm-hmm. uh, where it's not about your ideology. It's about who you went to high school with. No, yeah. It's not mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. ideology. No, it's yeah. not about yeah. whatever booger bear you want to put in the blank. Yeah. It's about who you went to college with, who yeah. your parents yeah. knew. Who your yep. friends know and like, and who can That's give right. you a hookup in later life or connection, no or, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. And just sort of this kind of, and and I don't mean to suggest, imply, or even say, yeah, that that's wrong. Mm-hmm. I just mean to point out that that's what's happening. And, yep. and it's dishonest to pretend that it's something entirely different, right? No, no, uh, no, yeah. right, right, right. right. <clears throat> that really, you're forming networks that are going to last you for the rest of your life. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, that's that's what's happening. And then the- I, I, gotta, I gotta admit, having two in college right now is a real mental exercise for me mm-hmm. and just trying to figure out what on earth are they doing? How are we gonna get through this? Mm-hmm. And how, how can I buffer what's going on there so that they I, I will say my oldest, mm-hmm. she she worked for a nearby bakery, a bakery restaurant the summer before her freshman year. Her conclusion from that was that she should sign up for the business school. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, oh my. <laughs> mm-hmm. So about halfway through, she called me up. Oh, dear. You know, like <laughs> like s- someone, you know, caught in a jail or something. And she said, I have got to get out of this place. What's the, what's the phrase? What do you mean? What do you mean? Of my poor, sweet summer child. <laughs> <laughs> so what, you, what did she mean? But, but yeah, what were we expecting? She said, well, I don't know. She said, I just looked around and I realized there are two kinds of people in this building. And I said, yeah. And she said, half of them want to work for Procter & Gamble and yeah, the other half yeah. are jocks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the wrong place, Dad. Yeah. I'm in the wrong place. I got to get so out of here. She right. crossed the street and went over to, uh, in Bloomington, it's the, the uh, school that Eleanor Ostrom taught in. It's called SPIA. Uh, something about social uh, social sciences, and I forget yeah. what else the acronym stands for. Mm-hmm. So she signed up for environmental policy, oh. and has felt much better ever much since. Much more at home. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, that's, that's an interesting conversation to have. It's that's a worthwhile conversation. Got that out of the way. Yeah. yeah. There's. But I, I'm sort of struggling with them. In other words, just to to wrestle through it. You know, and and to help them understand what their mentors are for, and. Mm-hmm. You know, mentors have a little bit of self-interest, so yep. yeah. you, know, yeah. you got to balance that. all these things. You know, it's, yeah. tricky. it's tricky. It's tricky. I'm it's trying to remember tricky. what publication it was that I read this in recently. It was some, it maybe might have been the New Yorker. I don't know. It's yeah. an article about how all these universities that teach economics actually have two economics departments. Yeah. Yeah. And one of them is the vaunted, you know, Chicago School of Economics, or what? You know, the the that. That follows whatever Austrian teaching and you know right. that mm-hmm. really teaches the economics from the ground up uh, theory and you know all this and the other is attached to the business school that's right yes. that teaches <laughs> them a little bit about actual practical economics and how it works in in the real world <laughs> yeah. and they're two yeah. separate spaces yeah, really yeah. so they're not actually that's overlapping true. in any meaningful <clears throat> no that's true yeah that's true. and and um, but it really I think lays bare this reality of how how very local all politics are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That it all comes back to like who, literally, who you're sitting next to. Yeah, in, right. In no, this, right. At these sort of um, um, <laughs> important nexus, nexus yeah. in our life. This is true. This is true. Yeah. Let, let, let me ask you. We have time for me to shift gears for one more solidary hall matter, please. Yeah. yeah. Um, one more. My crazy. Here, here's what it is. I I woke up a few weeks ago thinking about. Um, maybe because of my conversations with our friend Paul Grinier yeah. and his new project, 
the Simone Weiss Center for Political Philosophy. Oh, yeah. Which our friend Susanna Black is also involved in. Mm -hmm. um, well, so I was thinking about the fact that uh, I wish I knew Russian. And I then remembered, of course, that many years ago, and when I say many, let me just specify <laughs> 40. 40 wow. years ago. Okay. Just yeah. out of grad school, I decided what I needed to do was learn a hard foreign language right. for which I could get paid for knowing it. Exactly. And I thought about Chinese. I thought about various things. But I was reading some Russian literature, and I thought, no, what I need to do, I need to sign up for a trip to the Soviet Union. Wow. I need to spend yeah. the whole summer camping in the Soviet Union and just do a crash program and I'll come back, you know, with a much better Russian or a little bit of Russian. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm sure it'll be a life-changing event, you know. Yeah. What the hell to go to Russia for 3 months? It's got to change your whole head, you know. Yeah. So, so I did that. And I went. Um I was not terribly political. I was, you know, rather skeptical of course about the USSR. Mm -hmm. This was 1978. It was the summer wow. yeah. of the three popes. Oh. So Paul VI died. Right. John Paul the First was installed for a month. Right. And then had oh, a heart yeah. attack or yeah. some weird thing, died. And then in August, this Polish guy. Some weirdo. <laughs> this weirdo. <laughs> As we're in the Soviet Union, and a friend of mine on the trip who happened to be a scholar of Eastern Europe mm -hmm. told me the news, and he said, You understand, he's a Pole. He said, This is an earthquake. Wow. It's huge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I didn't quite, you know, get what he meant. Okay. Anyway, mm -hmm. so we, we had this amazing trip. And so I made notes. Mm -hmm. I did not have a camera, but I, I got copies of photographs from a friend on the trip who, who took quite a few. And, uh, and I kept my journal. And I really did nothing much with the trip. I didn't really write it up in any way. Right. But now it's many, many years later. And as I was reading some of Paul's stuff, and thinking about where Russia is today, I thought, you know, I should do a little short travel book. Mm -hmm. And I will call it a travel memoir. And in it, I am going to sort of rethink the Cold War. Mm. Oh, wow. Because mm -hmm. I really had not much of an idea what it was at the time, except in a very sort of distorted mirror. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so much has changed, and the country's changed, and the world has changed. So I'm doing my first book, really. And I've written about two chapters of it called In a Russian Mirror. Mm -hmm. And what I'm doing is using the Russian trip to talk about American empire. Oh, hmm. this is going to be playing, worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. Playing yeah. One off, well, that you, sounds cool. Yeah, playing one off the other. And it's very anecdotal because otherwise it wouldn't be readable, you know. Right, right. Uh, so I'm trying not to pontificate too much. But I, I am really staggered by how much I did not see. But I do, I do realize now that the guy who organized the trip, uh, whom I met either very briefly or not at all, I don't remember, he was a Russian Jewish guy teaching at MIT, teaching Russian. Mm -hmm. He was a wonderful kind of wild man who wrote a, a notorious Russian textbook, which reads like a Marx Brothers script. <laughs> wow. um, and is really famous yeah. for just these weird non sequitur conversations he, he wrote mm -hmm. up. He, he explained that this was a trip that was going to be maximally unrestricted. And what he meant was, if we do enough camping, you can go out and meet regular Russians. You know, right. you can get, oh, nice. You can get without the minders. And right. Right. Without the minders, right? Yeah. right. You, you won't, won't be in the official hotels. Yeah. And you will have some official guides around. But you'll get up close and, and involved with the ordinary Russian, which after the trip I realized was a great thing. Mm -hmm. because that is the way ideology breaks down. Right. You know, yeah. when, when you're yeah. there experiencing it and seeing it and living and talking to these people, it's a wonderful thing. It's really a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. So I thought of this when Paul was talking about his trip to uh, St. Petersburg a few weeks ago, and he went to the symphony, and he was listening to a Soviet composer, and how he was saying how wonderful the music was and how ashamed he was that he never paid attention to this guy because he was, after all, as Paul used to think of him, a Soviet composer. Hmm. Right. So somehow less worthy 
Less worthy noticed. of attention, yeah. right? Yeah, and but he was wonderful, just wonderful. So, mm-hmm. so I've been doing a lot of catching up on Russian history and where Putin came from. I understand yeah. much better, you know, that whole. Story. He makes more sense. Mm-hmm. Much yeah. more sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he yeah. really does. So, yeah. so that's kind of uh, my other side project, which I'm enjoying, going along at a fairly slow pace. But I hope I can write at least a little book, kind of a novella length. Yeah, book and um, you know just thoroughly annoy a lot of um, you know ongoing <laughs> cold warriors. Cold war, yeah. How we still have cold well, warriors we, is another question. Yeah, we're, but we're that midst, is really a great question. We're yeah. in the yeah. midst of another Russia gate, uh, and yeah, it's cold war. it's it's yeah. crazy. Ramp up. It is no, it is right. kind of crazy. So now, right. so we've got to have you back on twice now, Elias. <laughs> All, right. All right. Talk about your your book, book? when it's when it's out. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be and great. Um, talk about your trip to socialism 2018 yeah so. it'll it will be an adventure i'm sure yeah indeed all right i think are we there pleasure. i think we're there yeah it's thank a you pleasure. thank you so much for joining us a uh, short notice yeah. like i said we, we've 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 got uh people we've planned and wanted to have on but we're just really bad about organizing anything yeah you know <laughs> so, we're just trying to get through the day here most days yeah no no you're wonderful you're an inspiration to us all <laughs> thank <laughs> you very much thank you all right be well all you've right. been listening to the grace and paul podcast check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube. Bye. Bye, Bye guys. See you, guys.